Go. Grandma's way out party, June something, 93, 57, 30, y'all. Grandma's Way Out Party is made possible by grants from the Dayton Hudson Foundation on behalf of Dayton's and Target stores and the Jerome Foundation. Additional support is provided by City Pages, the alternative news and arts weekly of the Twin Cities, featuring Linda Berry's Ernie Pook's comic. I'm Linda Berry. I'm a writer and a cartoonist and an Irish, Norwegian, Filipino double Capricorn. And all my adventures begin the exact same way, with a late night phone call from my mother. Hey, Kevin, mom wants to know if you want to come to grandma's birthday party. Yeah. I'm Kevin Kling. I'm a playwright and storyteller and double Minnesotan with Iowa Rising. I'd been to grandma parties before. I thought I knew what I was getting into. I didn't know how I was going to tell him that it was in Seattle. 1,000. 653 miles. Come to Grandma's Way Out Party, our wild road trip weather. Come to Grandma's Way Out Party, her parties are the best. Follow us on your Harley, come to Grandma's Way Out Party. Good afternoon, Mr. Jones. I'm in uh, Kimball, South Dakota, and I'm standing in front of Grand Slam Taxidermy. And the Grand Slam are represented by the four sheep up above me, which are actually representative of the twins Kirby Puckett, Kent Herbeck, Chili Davis. And on the very far end there, that would be Harmon Killebrew. Uh, one of the things about when you're traveling and you're on that little magical, that little magical groove that is part of what a long cross-country trip is, is that you'll start to see signs, I mean regular signs, and, and one of the things that I've found is if, that I, if I read them like they are to me personally, like they're so, not just signs, but they're a sign, then I find that, the, that you get instruction on how to travel. And one of the best ones that we saw in the beginning of our trip was this place for Chef Louis, which is a steakhouse. And underneath it said, welcome as you are. Welcome as you are. Welcome as you are. But I knew a sign when I saw one, and that was it. Yeah, I remember thinking, I hope that sign's outside of heaven by St. Peter's Pearly Gates. Welcome we, as you are. We know for sure it's outside of hell. As we're driving into Mitchell, and we're definitely feeling the magic, the magic carpet of the road, all the signs that are pulling us, letting us know this is going to be a truly incredible trip. We see this sign at one of these drag places, like kind of backyard drag strips, and there was a sign that said, drivers and spectators. And, and drivers are supposed to go one way, and spectators are supposed to go the other. And I stood in front of it and thought, that's the central question of life, isn't it? Which do you want to be? Do you want to be a driver or a spectator? 
I went toward the driver's side. <laughs> Kevin will tell you that. <laughs> we saw this sign that said, this is another good life lesson to build it and they will come. What? Build what? I don't know. There's really nothing in the area. Hey, you guys, build it and they will come. Build it and they will come. Build we were confused. We didn't know that the secret would be soon revealed to us. Did you see Mitchell's Corn Palace? I'm not sure I think I am. I'm a little nervous. What are you nervous about? Because I don't, I've never seen anything like it. It's entirely made out of corn. Yep. One thing I couldn't tell Linda was I'd never been to South Dakota. It's because the governor of Minnesota said they were stealing our commerce. So whenever we went west, my dad took us through North Dakota. The first time I ever saw the Corn Palace, I was on this long cross-country trip with my dad and my brothers. And my dad knew the Corn Palace was there, but he just pulls off into Mitchell like all he's doing is getting a cup of coffee. And we drive by it like he's driving like it's the most ordinary building in the world. And when my brothers and I start seeing it, we freak out. We're like, Dad, Dad, look, Dad, stop. And it took me years to figure out that he did that on purpose. I mean, that was the way he wanted us to find the Corn Palace. <laughs> turns out that it's the Corn Palace's 100th birthday. There's this massive celebration, and we get this great book called The Corn Palace Story. And I find out that back in 1892, South Dakota had a really bad name because of all the snowstorms and the insects and the droughts, and they had these terrible dust storms. They used to call them black blizzards. And they were trying to figure out, how are we going to bring people out here? And then one day, this guy goes, hey, I have an idea. Build it, and they will come. And it worked. Here we are in Mitchell, South Dakota, and I'm standing in front of the Corn Palace. And behind me is a picture of uh, probably one of the Apollo space missions, I'm guessing, with one of the Apollo men. And here's another artist rendition. This time it's of the uh, Statue of Liberty from New York to South Dakota. And here's another rendition. This is of a jumping deer or elk. It's almost as if you, you can watch Bambi grow in years as you move your head across the panoramic scene. I found this lane here. A piece of art has dropped off one of the murals. Dear Mike, get a load of this. I'm inside the Corn Palace. Linda says it's not as good as the outside, but I don't know. There's food. What's the best-selling item at the Corn Palace? And friendly people behind the counter. The hot dogs weren't so good, though. We could only eat four of them. And there's a display on a taxidermist nightmare of South Dakota. We saw a fascinating movie called More Than a Building, and I laughed and wept, but Linda thought it could use a chase. There's souvenirs. Cool. And Linda met some Mennonite girls who stared at her in the bathroom. There's also corn murals on the inside, but they're treated with poison to keep away the rats. But the outside corn, anybody can eat. See you in three weeks. Kevin. OK. All right. Well, let me just get a shot of that. This is my contribution to the corn palace. <laughs> da, 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 da. A piece of history. <laughs> I got it. There was a job to be done. <laughs> <laughs> like, the, is the Y for yellow corn, or how does it work? Yeah, this is All right. yellow corn, light red, dark red, medium red. How long have you been working on the Corn Palace? Oh, about 10, 12 years. Really? Wow. Did you grow up here? Yeah. Did you always want to work on the Corn Palace? No, I thought it was a joke. <laughs> when you were a kid? Or, you, know, you know, you call it the world's biggest bird feeder, you know. Uh, we do got the fattest birds in South Dakota. They get fed, they get fed good. Yeah. Do they come and eat off of the corn palace? Oh, yeah. In the wintertime, they live on this side. You see where they, they put their uh, nest and stuff up here. Now, how does this work? They, do, who does the drawing of this thing? Cal Schultz does. This is great. How do you do, sir? Cal Schultz. We actually met the guy who designed all this, Cal Schultz. He's been an art teacher for 36 years. What's your favorite one you ever did? 1989. That was the year he let his ninth graders do the seed mosaics. 
I would have loved to have been in his class. I would have given anything to have worked on the Corn Palace when I was 14 years old. Me too. Mitchell's Corn Palace, 100 years of corn. Every time we're somewhere high, he always does something that makes me nervous. You gotta get in the car, there's bugs. Hurry, get out. Thousands of them. <laughs> Little black flies. Oh, God. Let's get out of here. I don't know what to do. I think we roll go with the windows rolled down really fast, right? Mm -hmm. ah! <laughs> now, where are you? About two miles from. Mount Rushmore faces and we're at Horse Thief. Since Horse Thief campground, mm -hmm. we're camping out on granite. Hey, Kelly, what are you looking for? Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care about the head. <laughs> I usually make the coffee um, as potent as the present administration. So, How's that coffee? Well, we might not have strong coffee for a while. Where is he? A little mountain goat. Boy, are they ever powerful. Jim, just walking across the road. Man, you can see how those guys can do that rock leaping thing. Man. That was worth driving to get coffee, wasn't it? A mountain goat. <laughs> Stay away from Grand Slam taxidermy. That's all I got to say to those guys. <laughs> I really want to do We come to this gas station to get gas, and there's more motorcycles than we've seen. It, it was sort of like the whole experience was like um, going into like like locusts or something, how they show it in a movie, or like the birds, like Albert Hitchcock, where you just see one or two, one or two, one or two, and then suddenly it's six and seven, and then it's a couple hundred. We started to realize this was a really big deal. This wasn't like a little deal. This was a really, really big deal. Sturgis is a, is a little tiny town. It's a one street with a bunch of businesses on it. And for some reason, that's where the Black Hills Motorcycle Classic is held. I mean, that's where all the bikers from all around uh, the states come together as brothers, as a tribe, and, and get together and do their biker things. And, and within Sturgis, there are all these different contingents. There's like the outlaw bikers, just like you imagine what bikers would be. You know, like that look like true, true badasses. They really do look rough. But then there were all the Christian bikers yeah. riding for the sun. Yeah. yeah. The Christian bikers, that, that caught us off guard. And I had never heard of uh, any bikers for Jesus before. Oh, yeah, we've been here. Since 86, was my first year, but uh, uh, it, here you get blessed, you know. And, uh, I had this track that was called, they handed it to me, it was called He Would Have Ridden a Harley, and who the, the he is is Jesus. But it's this thing about why, what bikers and Jesus had in common. And I'm telling you, when I read that, I suddenly had this uh, thirst for religion. I mean, it was like this, there was something about the fact that uh, as I was growing up, that the church was always like, it was so good, it was such a good place, that was God's home. It was such a good place that I felt like there was no way I could be that good without lying when I walked in there, that I would be a big liar. But once I saw these guys having their thing with the Lord on a Harley, maybe there is a way to worship God and, and ride a Harley at the same time. Cities, how you doing? We're live! Here in Sturgis having a great time! <laughs>
This guy had the head and the whole back of the wolf going down, but he was so big you couldn't tell. So when he turned around, you could see this stretched out wolf on his back that didn't even fit, and he proclaimed Linda his queen. queen. And there she is, here in the middle of Sturgis, in the middle of the Black Hills. Here we go. I'm the luckiest woman in America today. Arr, arr, arr. Arr. I love him so much. You know, he's the kind of guy I, uh, that, that makes you want to be fat, you know? Of course, man, if you're going to be an animal in the jungle, don't you want to be a big one? You know what I mean? Do you want to be like a little skinny one eating like one piece of lettuce? Or do you want to be like the big guy with the big turkey leg? That's real friendly. Hi, hi, come eat, eat at my table. Entrees on the wild side. And it says it's got to be tried while it's still in the hide. And they have center line bovine. It was a little scary to eat a hamburger at the Roadkill Cafe. Whipper will on a grill. <laughs> swirl of squirrel. How do you want them? Well, oh, well done. Without fur. Rigor mortis tortoise. Roadkill Cafe has been here uh, not quite a year. It's uh, pretty world famous. Uh, time to come, there might be franchises available. Uh, for a worldwide deal. The first roadkill cafe in China. What's your motto? Uh, from your grill to ours. <laughs> <laughs> What's the other one? You kill it, we grill it. The tattoos, almost in every place you'd go, there'd be somebody grinding away on a tattoo, working on somebody. What do you do, Terry? I'm a tattoo artist. That's another thing a lot of people have misconceptions about, which is tattoos, guys with tattoos, guys with tattoos. But there's something about the fact that they want something on them that they can't wash off, that, that even on days when they don't want people to know they're a biker, it's still there. And I have always loved that about people, like even like about drag queens who will like shave off their eyebrows so that they can draw perfect eyebrows on, or anybody who knows they're different and does something to themselves physically so that even on their bad days, they can't deny it. Because I think that in the end, that's sort of what saves your life, that you, you wear your colors, you can't help it. <laughs> lady could make you forget you were getting old. She had uh, this webbed outfit on. The webbing would just barely cover, um, cover certain parts. And it was very strategically planned. They said that you could get your, you, anybody could have their clothes done like that, you know. Oh, they did? Yeah, yeah. I, look, I, for instance, I could take some of my clothes and have why don't Web. you do that? Yeah, why don't you get a chainsaw? You know chainsaw art? A lot of people don't think it's art. And the reason they don't think it's art is because they never saw the guy making it. <laughs> and you sort of need what I'd like, is I would like one of those chainsaw sculptures of an eagle or a bear or whatever they make, and I'd like the guy with the chainsaw. I remember we were in the car pulling up, and I saw him, and I remember saying, him, slow down, I want to take a picture of these sculptures. And, and this guy was like, he, was, he looked like Thor. He like had all these muscles and these goggles on. He had this big chainsaw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was one of the wildest things. I mean, I remember I didn't have an appetite. I was starving. Then I saw him, and I felt like I never wanted to eat again. <laughs> I had been totally fulfilled. All I wanted was a cigarette and a nice beer. It's great. This thing, I highly recommend the rally in Sturgis. This is so cool. It is cool, right? Oh, oh I just ran over some animal. I mean, it already been run over a lot. Maybe we should scoop it up and rush it back to Sturgis and get on the Blue Plate special today. Ready? Uh-huh. Matigas Angulo. Nilinda. Matigas. 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 Angulo. Angulo. Nilinda. Nilinda. Hard is the head of Linda. Hard is the head. Matigas Angulo Nilinda Nakupu. Sometimes it sounds like a brick falling down the stairs. Goodbye. I had a delightful time. Paalam na. Akoy na siyahan. Nakupu. Masarap, Grandma. 
mom was teaching me, I asked her how to say happy birthday for you. How do you say it? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, grandma. On the trip to uh, kind of ease the, the tedium of the road, we'd always dare the, the other person to put on like, to put on the caveman mask and walk around in public. <laughs> And all of a sudden, this guy comes pulling over with a big old chew in his mouth. You can't swim in his air, son. It's too damn thin. <laughs> he had this cowboy hat, and on the top of his cowboy hat was a rattlesnake with his mouth open. Do you think we'll be able to make it over this mountain in the car? I don't know. Who's driving? <laughs> we hadn't really checked our gas gauge when we went up into the mountains, just happy as could be. Yeah. How's your gas? About a quarter of a tank. Oh, Jesus. A, qu a quarter of a tank. It's not wise to tackle a mountain without a full tank of gas. That's yeah. true. I don't know why I imagined it was just like, whoop! It was yeah. like over the hill, like a little ride at Disneyland. Use your head. Don't try to go 90 mile an hour. No, we won't. You ain't going to stay in the road to do that. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> and don't try swimming, son. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't dressed for it. <laughs> Have a nice trip. Thanks, Thanks a lot. lot. We'll Thanks. see you. <laughs> How high can this mountain be? It can't be that high. We have a quarter tank of gas and... We're just starting out. <laughs> just starting out. Here we go. The guys, the guys who just passed his lap did it. We can do it. I think we said we just have a quarter instead of we have a whole quarter of a tank. <laughs> I think he was a pessimist and we were an optimist is the way I look at that. It's beautiful though, isn't it? And the road was rocky as sin. Yeah. I don't know where we're headed. Dude, <laughs> that's, the, that's the earth down there, believe it or not. That's the earth. Yeah, it's unbelievable. I swear I can see my house. What are we looking for? A moose. Moose by him. He's up here somewhere. And then it came to a point where, for me, there was just too much nature. I like yeah. to be around uh, buildings a little bit. And... Where are we? I don't know, but I, I don't trust it. This isn't good for a Minnesotan. I wanted to see Old Faithful, because you grow up hearing about Old Faithful your whole life. It's a, it's a geyser. It's a piece of the earth that comes shooting out on time. It's not like Mount St. Helens or something that you can't count on. You can count on Old Faithful to go up right when you're standing there waiting for it, if you're standing there waiting for it. I said it was the best one right here. We missed it. We missed it. it, huh? Just missed it. Oh, no. Was it good? Well, yeah, it was. Uh, it, it lasted. We oh. thought it was going to, uh, we had like a false alarm. The last one was pretty good. Really? Yeah, it went up pretty good. But uh, uh, you just, yeah, you just, it just went off about five minutes ago. Oh. Hmm. How do you feel about missing Old Faithful, Kev? I'm bummed. Too bummed to talk about it? Really bummed. We missed it by just a couple minutes. Why did we miss it? Because we had to go to the bathroom. I can't believe I saw a moment. Maybe a miracle will happen, it'll go again. There it is. There it goes. Yeah, if we could see it, it said it goes off every 33 minutes, or the average is 64 minutes, or the mo longest it waits is 91 minutes.
There's a dachshund. This is the kind of color that goes better inside your body. We heard this singing. I mean, this really wild singing. It sounded like the wind. You'd hear it, and then it would be gone. And then you'd hear it, and it would be gone. And we just started running toward it. Is it yeah, where is it? Where is it? We come around this corner, and this procession begins. And the way the parade was, it was a bunch of, like, Broncos and Cherokees, the cars, um, coming, coming by that were, that were completely loaded down with... Um, the objects that the different tribes made, and then there would be people, mostly children, dressed in traditional um, costume or outfit, um, riding on the cars. And these, and then behind the cars, some of them would be pulling these flatbeds, and on the flatbeds would be all these men around a big drum, sitting on um, folded chairs, all of them, hitting the drum at the same time and making that singing that we had heard. One of the first things I thought when I walked in was, where did this come from? I mean, it was like walking into a, a foreign country, an absolutely foreign country, and then all of a sudden it hit me. I was the foreigner. I mean, this thing had been in this country, this land, for way longer than anybody that's part of my DNA had been walking on the land. that I had no idea, uh, no idea what I was looking at, no idea what the people were doing. And I remember being struck with this anger about why didn't I learn it? Why didn't I learn it in school? Why wasn't it part of our curriculum? How come I could walk into this thing that had been here as long as the dirt in this land had been here, and I didn't know a thing about it? And I had this feeling that even if I didn't know what the dances were about, I didn't have any doubt that they were about something, and they were about something spiritual and something big, and that it wasn't very far up in the sky. It wasn't miles and miles and miles away. It was in the grass, you know? It was in the horse that went by. It was in the sound of metal bells clinking on your dress. It's there. It's also in your body. It's mm -hmm. in your own body. Absolutely. These women were dancing in these beautiful medicine dresses that made all this clinking, this absolutely rhythmic clinking. And when I looked close, the little things that were clinking were the top of um, Copenhagen snuff cans. And it struck me as how wild that the most ordinary thing could turn into medicine, could turn into this beautiful, beautiful rhythmic thing. What I've always done since I was a kid is when I felt lost, I start drawing. So I had this notebook, and I started to draw. I started to draw some of the things I was seeing there. I mean, I felt lost. I didn't have any access. So I used my language that I learned when I was a kid to make me survive. And as I started drawing, these kids started coming around to see what I was drawing. I showed them some other pictures I had done. some boys playing with rocks in a game I never saw before. And then I drew uh, their portraits. I drew a portrait of Jake, and I drew a portrait of Desmond. And my intention was, if I was going to draw them, I was going to give them the picture. I mean, that was the whole thing. I didn't want to just take a picture. I wanted to make them something, make a trade. And we sure did make a trade. Kind of have two, two of these things around things. Right? Yes. I that. See? That's what you think should be doing this. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Desmond, he had this magic about him. You knew you were meeting one of those kids, you know. Jake was a whole different story. Yeah. Jake was, he was the daredevil man. And what he wanted to do with his life was become an engineer. And the reason he wanted to become an engineer was so he could build the biggest, scariest roller coaster anyone had ever built. And the reason he wanted to build it was so he could ride on it. <laughs> During the course of, of drawing, which is you know a process where somebody sits very still for you and you talk back and forth, in that quiet space, we made a connection with these kids that was um, really, really fortunate for us because I felt like, you know, at least I had some 
glasses to put on and, and begin to see the powwow, at least with some sort of context. They drew little pictures for me, too. And, um, and what was funny was there was one picture, I think it was uh, Desmond that drew it. It was like this pole sticking up with these uh, feathers hanging from it. And once he drew it, I saw them all over. <laughs> and the same with uh, Jake, when he drew that, that, that little man, it was like a little man who, he's like a medicine guy, who walks backwards and he plays a song out of an eagle bone. But he said, you don't know about him? He said, everybody knows about him. Everybody knows about him. And I thought, wow. What's your names? Uh, Jake. Jake? And what's your name? Carrera. One more time? Carrera. Carrera? And what's your name? And then the time came for them to compete. And I remember getting this really nervous feeling for them because um, they were, one, they were competing against each other, and yeah. we, we loved them both. <laughs> and then we found out that, uh, that in that particular case, the, um, the prize for winning the dance was, was a cash prize. Desmond told me that uh, dancing was fun and he loved to do it, but there was a little bit extra weight on it. He said that he really had to win. He said they had $7 worth of gas in the tank, and it took $20 to get home. I remember when we were out there, Desmond and Jake were out there. They're the best. They were the best. We're sitting there. They are the best. They are the best. Of course Desmond's going to win. There's no question. He is the best. And he, wa he was, though. Well, he was. Yes, yes, yes. He was the best. He was the best. But there's something that happens when you fall in love with a kid that's yeah. this sort of natural biological thing, which is they suddenly become the best to you. <laughs> I could barely watch. I mean, we, we filmed them, but it was really, really frightening. And in the end, I, I had to leave before I found out who won. <laughs> We got in the car and we were driving and we were driving quiet for a long time, just letting it, it come in. You didn't sleep last night? Mm-mm. How come? There's a train went by every hour. I had nightmares. There's ghosts in this room. <laughs> I'll bet. And then the children woke up. And I didn't have the heart to yell at them because my brother and I used to run through hotels too. And I know the fun attached to it. at the gate, remember he told us that, that all the exhibits were closed. Mm -hmm. But we, we, he was wrong, and we wandered into this miraculous, um, it was like wandering into the inside of a treasure chest. <laughs> It was like being at the Louvre for kids because, you know, at the Louvre, everything's crammed in there, so you got to really kind of pinch your vision down to see what's in there. That looks like me when I was a kid. It's Eric now, but I know just how Eric feels. And it's this big moment when you can actually put a person on paper. And so once you can do that, you can say that's a person 
I hate, that's a person I love, that's my dad. You could put anyone you want in there. I mean, it's a real powerful moment when you can take all the stuff that's inside you and put it on a piece of paper. I like this. D dad, be quiet, son. And George Bush. The president of the United States. Fuel for an alien. I started drawing because uh, I was transferred to a new elementary school in the first grade. And I couldn't make friends with the girls. I couldn't, because I was kind of, a, I looked like Alfred E. Newman. I sort of had kind of funky little clothes and stuff. And my teeth were all messed up. And I just did, I didn't have real good social skills. And we were studying the letter O. It was the alphabet. We were studying the letter O, but I could draw a little bit. And so I drew the letter O, and the word was orange. And then we had to illustrate it. And I thought, I'm going to make a picture that's going to make these girls like me. And I did. I made this picture of an orange grove with a river running through it with little goldfish. And sure enough, the queen girl, Nancy, comes up and wants that picture. And then I got to do copies of it. And all of a sudden, I was, you know, I was in. It's worked ever since. It's never failed, actually. Oh, great. Here, now are you in the picture? Uh-uh. Now are you in the picture? No. Well, help me. You were asking. OK, now I think I am. But we wrangled in Butte. Yeah. The odometer just flipped into fight. You know, it went from love to fight. In Montana is where you can get the big square donut baked here every day. I'm having mine with low-fat milk. <laughs> I ended up heaving those out the window. <laughs> The milk dropped, and uh, and that kind of just that was the unleasher to one. Or I don't know the the road weary travelers kind of. Yeah, we, we had got just into one. we had been in the car prison too long, and just I mean when I get mad, what I do is litter. That's like me getting evil. Is, is hurl a hurl a, hurl some litter out the window. Yeah, and it was on a clover leaf, yeah. turning back to Butte because we drove past Butte. And Linda, I always wanted to go to Butte. I'm driving <laughs> I said, yeah. You don't want me to get It's an insane kind of fight you can have on a trip when you've been together too long. You've been brushing your teeth next to each other. There's been no time apart. And you say something ridiculous like, you don't want me to go to Butte. You don't want me to go to Butte. All right, I'll turn around. And we did the old three clo leaf, clover leaf thing, round, round, round. And it was on one of those. Ding, the milk carton went out the thing. And then a few miles later, we were going, and Linda says, you know, that was, that was funny. I threw that milk cart in the <laughs> That was funny. We, 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 we should be laughing at that. And I thought, yeah, that was pretty funny. And, but we never did really break out laughing on that one. But you didn't want me to go to Butte. But I took you, you know, to Butte. Yeah, but I, you drove past it. I you didn't, you knew I wanted to, to go, and then you just drove past it. Oh, then we got back there. Yeah, but and you, you saw your door. Yeah, but I didn't want to tell Kevin about the door. I was so mad at him that I wouldn't tell him about the door. I said, why don't you walk that way for a while? I'm not showing you the door. And so there, I, were, there were two thrift stores next to each other, and we each went into a different thrift store. Yeah. That's what I remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was very heavy. But by the third thrift store, we were making up pretty good. Yeah, it's lucky they had three thrift stores. That's all I got to say about Butte. <laughs> I saw this sign. It was across the street from uh, from in the old state prison that said it was like prison art shop. Or, yeah. And it turns out that there is there's this this store that you can go to and buy artwork and crafts made by uh, guys who were doing time. I repaired one that was made in 1892. Had the date 1892 on it. And I'm trying to buy it and have the set one 1892 and one 1992. That'd be neat, wouldn't it? That'd be neat. One of the things that they do um, at that sh shop is they hitch horse hair. Yeah, on those belts, about an inch an hour is about as fast as you're going to get. They used to do macrame, but it turned out that some of the convicts were macrame and ropes, right? I had to go over the side of the... the... It's a pretty good program, though. It's really nice. I mean, if a guy's busy doing something like this, he doesn't have time to get off on anything else. Mm -hmm. you know, hell, I make 15000 20000 a year off of my hobby. And, uh, that works. Yeah, that's that's pretty nice. Yeah. I'd say really yeah. nice. Yeah. Well, I have a lot of the guards get upset with me because I make more money than they do and they just do. Hey, <laughs> we're paying your bill. Uh -huh. Yeah, don't try to get me to leave here. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs>
but I would go in a second. Yeah. I was seeing him in my world. I wasn't seeing him in his world. I mean, what would that be like to, to go out into the world and work in the world and then knowing at night you're going back into your little cell? You're really pretty. I'm the only person in the world that has ever copyrighted anything in horse hair. And I own, and I own the copyright on, this, on these Thunderbird belts here. Wow. That's a limited edition. There'll only be 50 of those belts ever made, and there won't be any more. I bet this guy, while he was growing up, would never dream in a million years that he'd be hitching horse hair. And not only would he be hitching horse hair, he'd be doing it in such a way that he felt so good about it that he had to protect his design, like with a copyright. I bet in a million years, they could have never predicted, you know, when they were their tough, swaggering 19-year-olds, that they'd be sitting there making these beautiful things. Wow! I was thinking about how, yeah, the mind is a powerful thing. Yes, it is. You know, you get uh, the mind on one side and desire on the other, and the guy goes, You got problems. You got problems. <laughs> <laughs> How are we going to connect the dots? All right. I think that was like a key moment between us and that guy. Something opened up at that point where we weren't just talking about things lightly. I mean, we were actually somehow coming to the same place. What's And what's this going to be? That's... Just Around. That's your present, Linda. How's that? Are you kidding? Thank that you. was just an old experimental piece, and I had no idea what I was going to do with oh, it. Oh, I now love I know. it. Stop back and see us. Bye-bye now. Life is all about finding places like the Muffler Man shop, where you you know you turn a corner and you see a guy who you all you think he does is lay under your car and replace the mufflers. And what's he doing with the old mufflers? You don't even think twice about it. You just drive away, making a little less noise than you did when you came in. And that guy at night is taking his mufflers and gluing them together and welding them together and painting them up and making a bunch of guys. Oh, he is. And I would love to have been there the first night when he was sitting around and the beer just did, wasn't doing it and hanging out with his friends wasn't doing it and the TV set sure wasn't doing it. And he said, hey, I got an idea. <laughs> I'll weld me a man. This is the weightlifter? Mm-hmm. Look at his knees. His These calves. are beautiful. Yeah. When I find a place like the Muffler Man place, I get this indescribable feeling of happiness, this feeling of witnessing somebody making art because they just can't help it. Maybe in your neighborhood, you have a guy who's like setting up way too many bird baths in the backyard. <laughs> the kind of guy that then sometimes when you're driving by, you'd say, why didn't he clean up that mess? Why didn't he clean up that mess? But I get excited when I see that mess because I feel like there's life. There's like a liveliness that's exposing itself where a man can rise up made out of a muffler and look like a man. And look you in the eye and say, what mess? Adrian! Check out Dean's drawing. It's a two-headed thing. I think that this urge to create is actually our animal instinct. And what's sad is that if we don't let that come through us, I don't think we have a full life on this earth. And I think we get sick because of it. I mean, it's weird that it's an instinct, but it's an option. Just like you can take a wild animal, a beautiful wild animal, and put them in a zoo. They live. They're fine in their cage. But you don't get to see them do the thing that a cheetah does best, which is, you know, just run like the wind, you know, and be able to jump and do the things. I mean, it's our instinct. It's instinctual. You know, it's our beautiful, beautiful, poetic, magical, mysterious instinct. You know, and every once in a while, you see the flower of it come right up out of a gas station. It's about 
2 in the morning. And um, we're really tired. And we have to be in Seattle by, I'd like to be there by noon tomorrow. Because my grandma's celebrating her 80-something birthday and they got a pig and all my relatives are going to be there. So we drove for 16 hours today. Maybe it was 12, a long time. And now we're here. We're having a little beer. Honey. Mm. I'm going to go over to the Happy Chief and get some coffee, OK? Mm-hmm. And I'll come back, all right? Forty minutes outside of my my neighborhood. How do you feel about that, Linda? I feel um, very nervous and a little excited, but mainly mainly I'm being flooded with a whole lot of memories. So I haven't driven this since '86 on my honeymoon. My ill-fated honeymoon after I got married in a trailer court. <laughs> I should have known. There were all kinds of signs that that marriage wasn't going to work. One of them was right after we got married in the trailer court in Yakima, Washington. And I'm in my little dress. And we're taking off to our chalet. Right on, you know, it's right around here, actually, where we took off to, to be up in the mountains. And we go into this bar. My ex-husband wanted to have a beer. So we go into the, the bar, and then he says, I'll be right back. And he's gone for like 20 minutes. And I don't know where he went. And he left me sitting in the bar in my little wedding dress drinking a beer. And boy, the guys in the bar teased me. They ran out on you. I've always felt that my grandmother and I were the same. We're made of the same thing. And she used to say this thing to me using this Tagalog word. She'd say, you and I, we are parejo, the same. We are matapang. That means very strong. We will even fight the aswang. You know, the vampire. She would say that to me all the time. So those were the Tagalog words that I love. Saan ang tumo? I am sleepy. Yan toko. My grandma, was she, she's this little, tiny woman. Her best friend was a midget, this guy named Raymond, with this really big head and was missing a bunch of fingers. So the house was, everybody was sort of the same size. And uh, my grandmother, to me, had these supernatural powers. When she smoked cigarettes, um, she smoked them. There's this way called sapalpal, and it's with the lighted end in, in your mouth. She smoked her cigarettes with the lighted end in her mouth, the reason being is that when you're planting rice in the rain in the Philippines, you can't have the lighted end of your cigarette sticking out because it'll get wet and go out. So they, lots of people know how to smoke with the lighted end in their mouth. And then I think to me, she was like this person who could do all these other, I mean, just amazing things. The last time uh, I was really, really broken up, really, really depressed, and I was kind of talking to her about how sad I was. And she said, you know, Linda, the world, the world is so round. <laughs> she just moaned up. Yes, it is. It is so damn round. <laughs> and too much traffic. There's the Space Needle. I was up there when I was four, the year after the World's Fair. Maybe we saw each other then. You might have. You do look familiar. You look familiar to me too. This is the outer perimeter of my neighborhood. What was amazing about the neighborhood is the neighborhood was really, really mixed. A lot of blacks, lots and lots of Asians. But the thing that was most interesting about it is that, by and large, it was a neighborhood of mixed couples. I know that how I see the world has everything to do with not being with a group of people who were all of one sort. The other thing that I run into as I come into to my street it, are not only my own memories, but all the stories that I've written about that street that have either been autobiographical or absolute fiction, but they've all taken place on that street. Here's where I grew up. 
where I grew up, Kevin Clay. We still have crack houses, but they're painted. This is the world that I was riding into. I was definitely in the passenger seat. The driver spectator, I was the spectator. My Uncle George lives at the top of the hill. My Auntie Alice lives on this hill. My all my relatives on my mother's side of the family who um, came from the Philippines, they all live within walking distance of each other. And it took me years to realize that what they were setting up was like their little village, like they had at home. That's it. There's my house. That's the house I grew up in. We bought this for my mom for Mother's Day when I was 15 years old. It was a little tiny thing. Hi, you guys. Since my grandmother, I think, hit 70, every year my family has a surprise party for her. And they set it up in different ways. Oh, Grandma, someone who you barely know is going to take you to bingo on your birthday while everyone else is gone. <laughs> on this year, it was going to be that Kevin and I were going to come in to take her to dinner. He learned some words. What, can you remember anything? Um, yeah. <gasps> Mahal kita. No. <laughs> uh, po. Masarap, Grandma. Yeah, that's very good. Oh, my Grandma, that's very delicious. Yes. yes. And I remember... Uh, Where they goodness. decide to have the party is in this old, crusty, old VFW hall. You, Maganda, too. <laughs> Thank you. So we're driving by these wrecking yards, and I'm trying to find this VFW hall, and she finally says, what? Oh, there is no dinner here. What are we doing? I walked in, and it was everything Linda said. Happy birthday! And looking around at all these people's faces that were all this mixture of colors and people and couples, it was just a big surprise for me. I would say that I was related to everybody at that party. I can't think of anybody I wasn't related to except for no, even if they are like your cousin's boyfriend, and even if they're your cousin's boyfriend and they've only been together, I don't know, three weeks, they're still your relative. That's the style. And I remember looking across the room and seeing this table full of food. I didn't even know what any of it was. Potato salad on the end. That was the only thing I could identify. so excited for you to get to eat this stuff because I knew yeah. which stuff would blow your mind and also which stuff <laughs> which stuff to definitely that you have to grow you have to grow up into it you know yeah when we were going through the line I had my plate Linda no yes no <laughs> no yes I wouldn't have known mm. I'd say for every three songs played, one was the electric slide, the next one was Happy Birthday to Grandma. Happy birthday to you. And then we'd hear another song, and then electric slide, and everyone would be up dancing again. Come on, everybody join them. If you don't know how to do it, you learn it. It's easy. When the disco craze swept through the United States of America, for some people, it swept through and kept on going. For my family, that was 
the greatest time in American <laughs> history. You can see it. It's electric. One of the things that I find really beautiful about it is it is it's, it's an organized, ritualistic dance. I mean, even if it's in the sort of ugly, crazy costume of a 70s disco hit so that you can look at it and think what you're looking at is something that's kind of cute and kind of corny, it really is a little tribal moment on the dance floor. But you know And so when my family gets together and does that dance, you know, it's always this really big moment. That's our, that's my tribe. Those are my people. Way Out Party is made possible by grants from the Dayton Hudson Foundation on behalf of Dayton's and Target stores and the Jerome Foundation. Additional support is provided by City Pages, the alternative news and arts weekly of the Twin Cities, featuring Linda Berry's Ernie Pooks comic. This program was produced by KTCA, a Minnesota original.